Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the meeting. Today, we're going to start a beer squad with JD. He's going to be doing a presentation on beer myths. So, uh, without further ado, JD, here's your vote. Take it away. Is that how it goes? All right. How's everybody doing today? I'm sorry if I feel, if I look a little lethargic. I've been fighting this bug that's been going around. So if I start to sound incoherent, that means I'm getting well. All right. We're going to do a little beer school here on beer myths. Basically beer myths, but it could be anything I threw in there. So we'll see how things go. So let's do this. Is it bottled beer better than canned beer? You know, some people think that bottled beers are better than canned beers and the other way around. And I don't know if it's really a myth, but let's see how we go here. With bottled beers, there's two concerns when you have your beer in a bottle. And that's oxygen and light. You know, the bottles aren't perfect. And somehow, over time, oxygen is going to get in that beer. And when that happens... What do we get? We get a skunky beer, okay? And a skunky beer, what is a skunky beer? And what causes a skunky beer? And that's the light. And what the light does is it reacts with the hops. And those little molecules of goodness, when it gets hit with light, it starts to destroy them. And then it binds, as you see, with the sulfur atoms. Sulfur atoms. And the byproduct, of course, is that skunky taste, that funky, skunky smell, which we don't like. So bottles, you know, they are good. We all like to bottle. We use our caps. But then again, there's a good chance you're going to get a skunky beer. So that brings us back to canned beers. So is a canned beer better than a bottled beer? Well, I think canned beers rule because oxygen's not going to get in there. But then you have that worry about that metallic taste. Sometimes you get that metallic taste and everybody says, that's why I don't drink beer out of a can. It just gets that metallic you know, taste or whatever. But that is actually a myth because according to craft cans, it's not the metallic in the can that you're tasting because they coat everything with this you know, material that keeps that metallic taste from the beer. But when you do taste that metallic taste, what you're tasting is probably your lips hitting the edge of the can, and that's why you get that metallic taste. So really, if you're going to drink a really good beer, whether it's out of a bottle or a can, what's the best thing to do? You want to pour it into a nice glass. Because after all, especially if you brew the beer, you want to see what it looks like, you know, how clear it is. But, you know. So always, whether it's a bottle or a can, it's a nice thing to take your beer, find the appropriate glass, which that in itself could be a whole different beer school, and uh, pour that glass and enjoy your beer. So really, you know, if it's bottles or cans, that's really up to you. I like them both. But then again, that brings us to, is draft beer better? Well, some people would say yes. And I would agree to a point that draft beer is a really probably the best way to drink your beer. But again, it depends on the bar because why? Cleanliness. If your taps are not properly maintained, what's going to happen? You're going to get some gook in there. And there are, of course, some bars that don't have a lot of patrons that drink a lot of their draft beer. So it might sit there for a while and they might not clean their lines properly. So even if you drink it from a tap, it might not be as good as a bottle or a can. So then here's your myth, which is better. Can bottles are off the draft. Really up to you, again, your taste. And uh, I don't know, it, it's all good. As long as it's beer, right? That's, that's the best thing. So, you know, bottles, cans, draft, that's all good. Uh, and again, the lesson learned, if you don't trust your bar, go to find a better one that has a, you know, a better draft. Or else, as they say, you'll be drinking an orgy of beer-loving bacteria, and we all know what that tastes like. That's really lovely. 
All right, now there's another myth that beer is best served cold. We've always heard that, you know, you want a really cold beer. Everybody says, hey, we brew our beer, we keep it in the refrigerator, everywhere it goes. Well, this could be a myth because most people say that, you know, the beer is best consumed between 46 degrees and 50 degrees. But when it's coming out of the draft line, they serve it really cold, 38 to 42 degrees because they keep every kind of, you know, everything inside their freezers. So the best thing to get a really good taste of beer is pour it if it comes out of draft. And like, you know, some people say, hold it in your hands for a few minutes. Let it warm up because sometimes beer is best when it's a little warm. And there are some beers that you want to drink warm, like a good stout. You want that to warm up for a while. That way you can get the flavors out of it. So really cold beer. Nah, I wouldn't go with it unless you, you know, have to drink a Budweiser. And then you, of course, you want that as cold as possible because you really don't want to taste it because there is no taste to it. That's why you want it cold. That's it. Drink it cold. Yeah. And then what's this about cold filtered? You know, some of these breweries say we cold filter our beer as opposed to what? Hot filtering it? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. So when you see something cold filtered, all marketing, don't worry about it. All right. Now, how do you stop the hangover? This is a good myth, because a lot of people think that you pop a couple aspirin before you go out drinking, then you're A-OK. -okay. Well, the problem with aspirin, it's just like alcohol. They're both blood thinners. So, you know, if you take an aspirin before you go drinking, what's going to happen is it tends to make your innards bleed a little bit, okay? Well, alcohol, you know, that doesn't make you bleed, but then again, if you mix the aspirin with the beer, you know, you're not really doing anything. It's not going to help you, and the aspirin's not going to be there in your blood in the morning when you wake up. So taking an aspirin before you go drinking is not going to help you much. And also, if you got to watch ibuprofen with some people because mixing that with beer is really bad for your liver. So you really don't want to take any kind of medicines before you go drinking. So, you know, that, that's a myth now. Uh, I think Mr. Cook from uh, Samuel Adams says he takes a teaspoon or a tablespoon of brewer's yeast before he goes drinking. And he says that helps him and he doesn't get a hangover. Well, the problem with that, and uh, I think they've done some research, I didn't get a chance to pull it up, but what does yeast do? Yeast converts sugars into alcohol. So if you're taking more yeast while you're drinking, it's just going to, you know, make more alcohol. And then some people say, well, it's the vitamin B that's in the yeast that kind of helps you. Now, that might have something to do with it, but they've done some research, and actually eating yeast before you go drinking is not going to help you much. So really, the best thing for when you go drinking, plenty of water. That's what's going to do it. Go drinking, have a couple glasses of water, especially when you wake up in the morning, drink some water, you'll feel a little better. There's really no hangover cures out there except time so forget yeah or hair of the dog that really doesn't help the hangover it just prolongs it makes you forget about it a little bit <laughs> that's it makes you forget about it a little bit all right now some people believe that stouts are more heavy and caloric than other beers that if you drink a dark beer you know it's got to be really loaded with calories and it's going to be really heavy well, this is a myth because Guinness, we know Guinness. As they say, it's a you know meal in a glass, but Guinness is a classic example of, could be a light beer. It actually only has 4.2% alcohol compared to some Budweiser's, which is 5%. So Guinness would be considered more like a light beer even lighter than Budweiser. So, you know, you can't go by the color of the beer thinking this is a heavy beer. That's just the color of the beer, and they get that by, you know, roasting your grains. So, you know, don't let anybody fool you and think that if you look at a, a dark beer, you're drinking a real heavy beer, and you can only have a couple of them. That's, that's a, you know, a myth in itself. And like I said, you know, the alcohol content is a lot different. But... You know, it's how you brew the beer and the grains you use. And and there's another myth about 
Guinness also is a lot of people say that the Guinness served over in Ireland and the Guinness that we get here are two different beers and they export a different beer for the North American market. This is a myth. It's actually the same beer, but the difference is time. Like we said, as beer sits in its container longer, it tends to deteriorate. And that's what happens with Guinness. It takes two weeks to get the Guinness from way in Europe over to North America, and then probably another week to get it to your bar. So the beer you get, the Guinness we get here, is already three weeks old. So that's the taste difference. It's actually the same beer. It's just, a, you know, over in Ireland when you get it, it's fresh. You're drinking fresh beer as opposed to beer that's almost a month old by the time you get it here. So yeah, that's kind of interesting about Guinness. A lot of people have been taught that the Mayflower stopped because they ran out of beer. This is what we all told, you know, we ran out of beer, this is where we're parking, and we're gonna, you know, start a brewery and, and get to town. Well, this, as a matter of fact, is kinda true, but not really true. It's, you know, like we say, it's a little more complicated. You have to remember that the Mayflower was the Uber of its time, all right? It had to go and take people back and forth, so, on long trips, they're not going to drink this nasty water. That's why they drank beer, because beer was safe to consume. But they only had so much beer on board. And as the captain's going, he has to realize not only does he have to drop off his uh, fare, but then he has to make the return trip. So what was happening was they were getting low on their beer. And he knew that he had to have enough beer to make the return trip back to Europe. So this is why they kind of dropped them off a little bit early and they started their colony, but not because they ran out of beer, but because they were getting low and he wanted to make sure his crew would survive the trip back. So the Mayflower actually uh, didn't stop because they were out of beer. It's just that they were getting low and they needed to get back and do it again. And again, a lot of people believe that the um, Mayflower and the, and the colony set up the first brewery in North America and that's false also. About a decade before the uh, Pilgrim showed up, there, the Dutch were there and they actually built the first brewery, uh, something like 1612, I believe it was, or a decade before. So, you know, even though they uh, got dropped off and they had to start brewing their own beer, they weren't the first beer brewers in America. So, that's a little back to you there. All right, now one of our uh, members sent in a question, and believe me, the next couple words coming up, I can't pronounce. All right, so you're going to have to help me with it. But he said something about the myth of caramelization while boiling, the difference between Maillard, Maillard reaction, and caramelization. I'm getting way out of my uh, comfort zone here, but let's see what we're talking about. Something about ducks. <laughs> The Maillard reaction is responsible for browning and flavor development in a variety of cooking applications, and sometimes it's confused with caramelization. But in the context of boiling wort, what we usually encounter is the Maillard reaction. And this reaction is also known as browning. And when you toast beer or when you sear meat, the reaction you're getting is the Maillard reaction. And that's where the sugar is kind of uh, caramelized, but it's not really caramelization. And uh, this, reaction, it, oop, oop, this reaction is what gives us darker mark, uh, malts, and it depends on how long they roast things. They're not actually caramelizing them. They're, uh, the reaction, that, as we know, is this Maillard reaction. And I was going to put up the uh, um, chemical display of what's actually happening, but I didn't understand it. I'm sure most of us wouldn't, unless uh, there's some chemist here. But uh, it's actually not caramelizing the malts because caramelization is, in the other hand, it's the decomposition of the presence of oxygen. And what you're doing when you caramelize is you're heating the sugar up so high that it falls apart. So there's a difference between the uh, caramelization and the malleable reaction. So. If anybody understands that, thank you. 
and maybe you can explain it to me, but there, there are two different things, and that's what gives you the different colors of the beers, depending on how that reaction goes. Now we come up to this one. Does beer make you fat? Yes. Well, <laughs> it could. But let's look at it, because it seems that whoever coined this phrase, beer belly, has a vendetta against beer. Because there's excess calories from beer are no more likely to contribute to weight gain than excess calories from anything else, like eating lots of sugar or, you know, lots of hamburgers. Um, and if you're worried about carbohydrates, a typical 12-ounce beer has a carb load similar to a glass of wine, which is roughly 10 to 20 grams. And according to the study, it also contains roughly 2.5 grams of barley-derived fiber. And that puts beer on par with a slice of a whole wheat bread. So really, drinking a beer is not that bad unless you want to eat a whole loaf of bread. Right? Now, you get fat not by drinking beer, because while you're drinking beer, you want to do something else. And that's eat. You know? Or you might have some more peanuts, you know? Or grab something else. This is what really kind of puts the weight on the belly. It's not the beer itself. Beer is actually healthy for you, especially home-brewed beer, all right? Yay! Now, why would home-brewed beer be more healthy for you? It's that little settlement that's on the bottom of the beer. It's that yeast in there, because in that yeast is vitamin D, all right? And that's good for you. So, you know, drink a home-brew. You won't get fat unless you keep eating. But then again, you'll be a little more healthier. It's good for you. Which brings us to this. Does beer make you lean? Well, beer doesn't make you fat. It makes you lean. I guess tables, chairs, walls, ugly people. And, you know, again, it's everything in moderation. Oh, that could be too. Like I said, I am not quite well here. All right, now. This brings me to my last and final one. Homebrewed beer. Is it the best beer? Yes. What would y'all say? Yes. yes. You mean there's no commercial beers out there? It's better than homebrewed beer? Hell no. All right, there is one beer that I would say is better than any commercial beer. It's better than any homebrewed beer. Yeah, believe it or not. The ultimate, the best beer that there is in the world and of course, this is my opinion. Yay. Yay. All right, we going? Sorry about the uh, short comp compilation here, but again, I'm not all with it this week. But thanks for attending. Something we do together here, and we appreciate it all. I was hoping Bob would be here by now because Bob Weeder had brewed some beer with that. What up? With the uh, yeah. yeah. And uh, he was supposed to be here, and he was going to share some with us. So, uh, really, yeah. So we still got a ways to go. Uh, again, appreciate it, everybody, and we'll do it again next month. And hope I'll be feeling a little better. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Uh, one more quick uh, round of applause for JD. That was an awesome presentation.